Ever had a taste of the stuff on the left? Sure, then you've already tasted what Native Americans used to make from the desert asparagus family. Today, we're looking at agave, sotal, and yucca, which are all members of the asparagaceae family. You gotta admit, their flower stalks look a lot like a giant asparagus stalk. Let's do this. A Hiker's Guide to Plants of the Desert Southwest, including cactus, wildflowers, native trees, interesting bushes, and the agave family. You'll learn where to find them, how to identify them, when flowers and fruit are available, and which ones are edible. Combining expert content on outdoor adventures with videography tips and tutorials. Visual adventures with Kurt Papke. This agave is dying at the very same time it is desperately trying to reproduce by sprouting a flower stalk. This trait is called monocarpic. You may hear them referred to as a century plant, which is a gross exaggeration because they only live 30 to 40 years or so. Very large cultivated agave varieties are often used as landscape plants in Arizona. Why would you plant something that takes 40 years for a flower, only to have to break your back digging out the remains of a now dead plant? Agave desert tie is the most common agave in the Sonoran Desert. It's not nearly as huge as the big landscaping specimens, only about two to three feet in diameter, and it's more green than blue in color. Look for the distinctive teeth along the leaf edges, and do be careful of those teeth. They will slice your shin right open if you scrape against them. All the members of the desert asparagus family prefer upland rocky slopes, so you have to do a little climbing into the hills and lower mountain regions to find them. This is actually a cluster of agave plants along the Linda Vista Trail where the mother has produced pups, as the clone offshoots are called. When the mother plant dies after sprouting, the pups may have a long life ahead of them yet. Agave flower stalks usually emerge in March or April and can be huge. This one along the Romero Canyon Trail near Catalina State Park looks to be around 12 feet tall, about twice the height of the guy that's walking past it. This one that I found near the Rogers Trough Trailhead in the Superstitions really shows the distinctive asparagus look to it. When the flowers mature, they produce seed pods, which darken and stay on the stalks a long time, as you can see in this specimen along Blackett's Ridge. They can also produce little plantlets, which you can pluck off and plant in a pot. The spent agave is the dark one on the right. The fuzzy light one on the left is sotal, which we'll talk about in a minute. After flowering, the plant dies and gets really crispy, but the spines along the leaf edges stay sharp for a long time. Note that the tipped over agave stalk distributes the seeds and plantlets well away from the mother plant which helps it spread. Native Americans had many uses for agave, from roasting and eating the sweet crown to using the fiber for cordage. They were so important that they loosely cultivated them, building small dams and water channels to provide moisture for the growing plants, and the remaining roasting pits can be found in the Catalina Mountains. Next, let's look at Sotal, the most ubiquitous of the desert asparagus because it tolerates hotter conditions than its brethren. These photos let you compare and contrast the two. Sotal is in the background, agave in the foreground. The leaves are not nearly as tapered as agave and have serrated edges like a hacksaw blade. You will often see sotal trim back along the trail, like this one along the Pontotoc Ridge Trail to prevent lacerations on hikers' shins. Like agave, sotal has a large crown, which is very visible in these specimens burn in the Bighorn Wildfire in Catalina State Park. These crowns were harvested by Native Americans as a food and are used today to make a mezcal. Sotal is sometimes called the cup plant because where the leaves attach to the crown, there is a large petal structure which looks like a cup or ladle. Unlike agave, sotal flower 
every couple of years and do not die immediately afterward, although the specimen in Catalina State Park probably flowered one last time before giving up the ghost after a wildfire. They produce large distinctive flower heads. Satal are a very common landscaping plant for southern Arizona and is found in many yards and highway medians. This grouping was right outside my gym. Plants are inexpensive and don't need a drip irrigation system to thrive. Native Americans used satal very similar to agave, though they cultivated and harvested less satal because they couldn't get as much syrup from it. After removing the barbs from the leaves, they were used to make mats and sandals, which makes sense since the leaves don't taper like agave and yucca. Speaking of yucca, let's move on to them next. Yucca were the most prized by Native Americans of all the desert asparagus because the plants had so many uses, but they are also the most difficult to find because they're kind of picky about their elevation and growing conditions. I normally don't see them until I climb to 4,000 feet or so. To me, yucca plants look like an agave growing up off the ground on a short trunk. The extreme example are Joshua trees, which are really yucca brevifolia. Yucca leaves are green, narrower than agave, and taper to a point and often have wispy fibers at the edge of the leaves. Like satal, they will flower every three to five years, and their flowers and fruit are edible, which are partially why they were so valuable to the Native Americans. Like agave, the flowers emerge in March and April. Yucca baccata, or banana yucca, is the most prevalent variety you're likely to see along the trail. Both the flower pods and the fruits look like bananas to me. Compared to agave and satal, yuccas have much shorter flower stalks, typically no more than five feet high, and their flowers are much larger and less numerous. That's probably why the fruit is so much bigger. The best place I have found to discover native yucca plants is in the Tortolita Mountains along the Wild Mustang Trail. But you will also find them in Madeira Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains, and here's one along the Salisbury Trail in the Chiricahuas. Yucca love the Oracle area at the north end of the Santa Catalina Mountains, as you can see from these impressive specimens along the Granite Overlook Trail in Oracle State Park. This park has the most accessible specimens of yucca because the whole place is just over 4,000 feet in elevation, which is what these plants like. I harvested some banana yucca flowers that were past their prime in order to taste them. Just a handful to have a little taste. Step one was to separate the flower petals from the rest because I didn't know how much would be edible. Step two. Cut the tough stems off the flowers. Step three, cut off the tips of the immature fruit that was beneath the petals, kind of like trimming beans or snap peas. Step four, add some water to a pan with the burner on. My plan was to boil for a few minutes, then fry in butter. I added the fruit to the water, first thinking they would need longer cooking. I then covered the pan and let it cook for four minutes. Yep, definitely boiling. With one minute to go, I added the flowers, then covered the pan for the remaining minute. Drained the water, added butter, and sauteed for a minute or two. Added salt and pepper at the end. Voila. Time to taste our flower buds and our young fruits from the yucca tree. Flowers are good. Um, Mind me a little bit of peas or something. Let's try one of the shoots here. Mmm. Those are fantastic. They're like eating uh, snap peas. They're sweet, tender, absolutely delicious. I would take the fruit, the young fruit, over the flowers any day. But flowers are definitely edible. Mmm. Oh, 
That fruit is great stuff. Before we move on from yucca, let's briefly touch on soap tree, or yucca elata. The best place to see this is at Oracle State Park. It is far taller than banana yucca, almost the size of a Joshua tree, and the flower stalks almost double its height. The leaves are also much narrower, and there is often a cluster of the leaf fibers at the center. These get very similar flowers to the Bacata species. So I'm going to wrap up with a couple of less well-known desert asparagus species that are worth just spending a few moments on. The first one is Agave shatii, commonly known as the Shin Dagger. As the name implies, this little guy can inflict some serious damage on your ankles and shins if you're not careful along the trail. It is inedible due to its bitter taste caused by saponogens, which as the name suggests, the plant was used by Native Americans to make soap. It has the familiar asparagus flower sprouts, but stay away from these and don't try to eat them. The best collection I know of shindaggers is along the Pontotoc Ridge Trail. Last but not least is beargrass, or Nolina microcarpa, which is in the same subfamily as Satal. Native Americans certainly ate the flower stalks and fruit, but its most important use was for roof thatching and sometimes weaving baskets. Unlike the leaves of the other plants we've looked at, beargrass leaves are much longer and flexible. The leaves have ridges that parallel their length and have a V-shaped cross-section. These two traits help the plant carry rainwater towards the base and are likely why they make such good thatching material. Beargrass is not nearly as prolific as Satal or Agave, but where conditions are right for it, such as at Oracle State Park, there are entire fields where it is the dominant plant in the landscape. One can imagine Native Americans organizing expeditions to gather and carry back thatching materials for their houses. Hey, that's it for today's discussion of desert asparagus. I hope you found this video interesting, and if you did, please click like or subscribe down below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the trail.